So if willful blindness is, as it appears to be, a significant threat to the way that we lead our organizations, what causes it? How can we understand it? And if we understand it, could we find some really effective antidotes to it? And so this led me through what may sound a little depressing, but actually turned out to be quite fascinating, which is a multi-year study of kind of business car crashes, things that had really gone wrong, which had been incredibly public, where it was very clear that the knowledge was out there, but the management and the leadership had been blind to it. And I did that because I wanted to understand how they happened. And if I, on the basis that if I could understand how they happen, maybe we could avoid them. So one of the first um, examples that I chose for no particular reason, except it was a British company and an American company, and I live in Britain, but I'm from America, and I work both places a lot, was a refinery fire in 2005 at the Texas City refinery owned at the time by BP. And I chose it partly because it's a very well-known event, it's a very well-known company, but mostly I chose it because the accident had been so exhaustively studied by three outside parties that I didn't have to draw conclusions about how this had happened. There were plenty of expert opinions out there about how this had happened. So on the day of this accident, a young man named Warren Briggs drove into work and he sat in front of his console of 24 screens monitoring this particular part of the refinery. And I went to Texas City and I visited the site. It's a kind of strange place. It feels a little bit like a settlement on the moon. But Warren Briggs was working there. He'd worked for, for many, many years. He knew his job well. And an alarm started to go off. And he realized something was wrong, so he tried very hard to get the alarm to stop. But before he could do that, essentially a tanker load of gasoline was expelled up into the air, creating a vast vapor cloud. And when a nearby car backfired, the whole thing blew up. 15 people died that day. Over 100 people were injured. It was one of the worst industrial accidents in American history. And the causes of it were absolutely identical to the causes of Deepwater Horizon a few years later. So what really happened here? Well, let's go back to Warren Briggs, one of the only people who was fired after this accident. Warren was working his 30th day in a row, and he did 12-hour shifts. What that means is that he had an accumulated sleep deficit of a month and a half, which is a technical way of saying he was dog tired. Now, we all work really hard, I work really hard, and I'm often very tired, but I didn't really understand fatigue until I started studying this accident. And here's what you need to know, which is as you get very tired, the part of your brain that's responsible for keeping you alert fundamentally takes over. And it says, all the energy coming into the brain in the form of glucose, I've got to have it. I've got to have it to stay awake. And so it's siphoning energy away from the other parts of your brain, which are responsible for critical thinking. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this makes perfect sense, right? Because if you're walking through a jungle and a tiger jumps on you, it's much more important that you're awake than that you can think about exactly what kind of tiger is it and what might his motives be. But the thing is, you know, we're mostly not walking through these jungles anymore. We're mostly doing a lot of critical thinking, and we need that brain capacity. But after you've lost just one night's sleep, it is severely debilitated. You can demonstrate this in a really kind of cool experiment, as academics love to do. So you can take a whole bunch of university students, and one bunch you can make stay up through the night, and the other bunch, I think probably the luckier bunch, they get to drink enough alcohol to take them over the alcohol limit. 
and then you put them on driving simulators because you want to see which of them is more disabled, the really tired people or the drunks. And if you ever have to make this choice in real life between somebody who's probably just got off an international flight and somebody who's over the alcohol limit, take the drunks <laughs> because they can still think. The people who lost one night's sleep can't. Now, I think this is really interesting because it's incredibly simple. And yet the way that we mostly manage ourselves and many of the people working for us absolutely flies in the face of this. So one reason that Warren Briggs can't really solve his problem is because he's so tired that he quite literally cannot think. He knows he has a problem. He knows he desperately wants it to go away but he can't think through what it means or what he should do about it. So that's his first problem. The second problem is he's looking at 24 screens. In other words, he's multitasking like mad. And we all like to think that we can do this stuff. Of course, women in particular have been told that we're just brilliant multitaskers. But the truth of the matter is your brain is not designed to multitask. It cannot do it. It will not do it. It will not do it if you're female. It will not do it if you practice. It is not designed like a computer with dual processors. You can think about one thing <coughs> at a time. Now, you can flip back and forth between those things very, very quickly, but two things happen when you do that. One is, you get very tired. And the other is that between this task and that task, there's a, a moment of time where there's nothing. It's a kind of blind spot. So you're working very, very hard. You're trying to do several things at once. You're exhausting yourself. And a huge amount of that time and effort is really going into a black hole. One of the best ways I demonstrate this with some of my MBA students is I'll show them a clip of um, a business news report. And typically, it'll have a couple of scrolling lines at the bottom with stock prices and things. Sometimes, if it's a weekend, it'll have weather forecasts or sports scores down the right-hand side. And in some little box is a hapless CEO trying to explain his corporate strategy. And I'll play them this clip. And then I'll ask them questions about, well, what do you remember of this? And the really eager students will probably remember a stock price, or they'll remember the name of the company or the name of the CEO or something. And then I'll say, what do you think of the CEO's strategy? What's wrong with it? And I have never, ever got an answer to that question. Because while my students' brains were so busy keeping up with all of this noise on the screen, the one thing they could not do was think about it. Now, having spent years in broadcasting, I have a suspicion that's what that format's for. But motives aside, the truth of the matter is there is a very hard cognitive limit to what our brains will handle. You can think of it as really quite a narrow pipeline. And it really doesn't matter how big a hose you attach to it. Only a certain amount will get through one thing at a time. And yet, we mostly work in ways where we are trying so frantically to keep up with so much that while we may absorb a lot, what we can't do is think about it. So Warren Briggs can look at all these 24 screens, but he can't interpret what all of this data actually means. He is literally blinded by the amount of information in front of him. So Texas City is a kind of model accident because all the information is there. It's freely available. It's perfectly comprehensible what's going on.